Hello and welcome to an Infinity the Game list highlight video. Today we're covering three lists from the Infinity Global League January 2024 event, which commenced in late January and ran through a round of 90 into a round of 16 across seven rounds. So Infinity Global League, for those who are unfamiliar with it, plays at a relatively leisurely pace to accommodate players from multiple different time zones around the world. So they'll typically do one round every one or two weeks, which means that for a seven round event, you're looking at something like a couple of months to play. For those interested, you can find all of the details on the IGL website. If you just search for Infinity Global League or follow the link in the video description below, you will find them. And the scenarios that they played for this event were Last Launch, Armory, and Frontline before cutting to the top 16, where they played Engineering Deck, Firefight, Unmasking, and Firefight again. Players were allowed to submit new list pairings when they, once they got to the round of 16. But something that you can see, and I think the lists are publicly available, something that you can see is that most players chose to just make minor variations to their list pairing and otherwise continue playing what they had been playing already. Now, something to note is that this is not going to be a list analysis video. I am just highlighting lists that stood out from the IGL round of 16, and which I thought were just really, really cool. So this video is a chance for me to talk about them a little bit, give them something of a highlight, and really just gush, gush enthusiastically about them, because each of the players here is doing something that I think is cool and interesting and a little bit different, and deserves being talked about. Again, all three of these lists were players that made it into the round of 16. We'll be covering the player who came 13th out of 90, 5th out of 90, and 1st out of 90 players. All of those are impressive accomplishments. Before we get into those, I'll just do a couple of honorable mentions. There were a few lists that we won't be covering now, but which I thought were just very cool and solid. So uh, ones that stood out to me were King Butt playing Varuna, who just extremely clean looking cutter lists, four cutters across four lists, the lieutenant in every case. And that really showcased how you can learn something, but then flex it across different scenarios because each of those four lists that he played showcased just different ways to push the cutter list in different directions to accommodate different scenarios. Then we have Lobo running what I can only describe as like thoroughly classic never goes out of style nomads. Reading Lobo's lists literally triggered a wave of nostalgia in me because these were I think some of the very like these were very very close to some of the very first lists that I played in Infinity and 4 and nomad lists like that are very very fun and I can absolutely imagine Lobo being an absolute menace with them. Finally we have a Spiral Core list by Serpentis running Triple Dral Triple Impersonator. I believe it was Janstar and a Quitan Impersonator and a Gryph Operator which I am choosing not to cover simply because I have no freaking idea how to even talk about that. That is some absolute madman level play and very well done to Serpentus for coming third out of 90. So jumping into the first of three lists, we're looking at the player who came 13th out of 90 players, Stripless running Drew's Bayram Security. Stripless was running a 15 trooper list, the first combat group comprising of the Drew's EM and regular like Grenade Launcher Profile, a Drew's Hacker with Combi Rifle and Pitcher, a Brawler Lieutenant, a Brawler Doctor, a Brawler Multi Sniper, Tao Wu with an Emirat, Ada Swanson FTO and a Digger, Saito Togan with a Specialist Operative Upgrade and a Clipper, and then in Combat Group 2, a Yan Yan with APCCW, not sure why that's an AP rather than a DA, but I assume he had his reasons, Fagazi Dronbot, Fagazi Dronbot, Fiddler, and a Camille. Now, just to note, this is a list that obviously was drafted at some point in mid to early January. In April 2024, I would kind of expect this list to do something like maybe include Zelen Kriegers rather than Yanyans, although it's very possible that Stripless actually would prefer, still continue to prefer using Yanyans. That's just a matter of preference. I would like to play, actually, I would like to get to playing some Drews soon myself, trying out Zelen Kriegers and seeing how they impact the faction. This list otherwise is what I would consider basically a really, really good starting point for do you want to play Drews in events? Because by God, you can now. This is something you can actually do. Like for a very, very long time, Drew's Bayram security were like, they were the meme faction. They were the faction where no matter what you played, you could say, well, I'm not playing Drew's at least. But Drew's are a faction that have been not buffed exactly, but just expanded by like almost by stealth over multiple, multiple months, multiple releases. Every time like a mercenary has come out, it's just happened to slot into Drew's Bayram security. And some of them have slotted in as link team members, including pure link teams, which means you get full composition bonuses. 
which has left Druze in a really, really interesting place. Now, Druze themselves are still pieces where you want to be careful not taking too many of them. It's not surprising here that Stripless has chosen to take only two Druze in his Druze list, but those Brawlers and that Digger, in fact, literally every linkable model there counts as a Druze for composition bonuses, which means that presumably what's being run here is a five-person core and then a three-person Harris team. Now, this is how the list was laid out. So my assumption is we have a five-person core built mostly as a firebase. So we have the Brawler MSV multi-sniper rifle. It's going to be provided smoke by possibly Saito, but realistically the Yan Yan. Then we've got a Brawler Lieutenant, a Brawler Doctor, the Druze Hacker. So we have a fully linked maximum ballistic skill bonus pitcher, and of course the Druze EMLGL. Now this is one of the pieces that since the fire team update has set Druze apart, but which Druze, they need, they need to be more in a list than just truly fearsome spec fire capacity, but it is truly fearsome. Druze have a little bit of an equipment bloat issue, but that equipment bloat kind of goes away when we're talking about speculative fire, because x visors, which normally you wouldn't pay many points for, are genuinely useful in that kind of a piece. Ballistic skill attack plus one damage is excellent. So this Druze is rolling in at ballistic skill five goes down to nine, it's effective out to 32 inches, and it's firing plus one damage, electromagnetic or regular grenades, which are a threat to everything. This is not necessarily the core of a game plan, and you can see the rest of the list is doing like tons and tons of things. There's a lot going on there, but that can be like, you can, you can always have that in the back pocket and potentially use it. And that's really, really cool. Now the rest of the core, it's not wasting slots either. There's the Brawler Lieutenant, which is basically one of the things about Druze that it doesn't have fantastic Lieutenant options. You are going to often just take a Brawler because it's cheaper. Tao Wu here, I, I assume in some scenarios is going to be pretending to be another Brawler with rifle, rifle and light shotgun, just to give you a Lieutenant decoy while still having something happening with that profile. It's only five more points than just taking a secondary Brawler. And that's a very reasonable cost for counterintelligence and the other things that Tao Wu does. But he could also very easily pretend to be something with a gun. There is only four and a half points being spent in this list, which means that if he wants to pretend to be something like a Druze or Brawler Sniper, he could present a very credible threat that your opponent might play around, despite the fact that you haven't actually spent the points on that. We've also got some real power pieces here in the presence of Saito Togan, who is who is admittedly expensive, but which this list has managed to afford. He is never like he is he is the ninja that ninjas wish they could be. He has actual smoke grenades, which is just so useful combining with stealth to get into close combat. And once he gets into close combat, he will absolutely rip you up. And he's a specialist operative. I think that profile is only available to Druze, which means that although you're paying an absolute premium for that piece, you get serious killing potential and a midfield specialist, which if it didn't have smoke grenades, I'd be very leery of paying 37 points for. But the fact that it has 37, it fact that it has smoke grenades means that even at 37 points, it has some kill potential that I'm willing to contemplate. We then have Fiddler, who I wouldn't be surprised if she is spending quite a lot of the orders in that combat group, with the Yan Yan often just doing something like spending its impetuous order to throw some smoke. And Fiddler is a piece that absolutely can spend orders, maybe even flip into the first combat group at some point, because when she goes on a tear, she can really go on a tear. Now, the Camille in that, in that combat group, normally I don't like taking Camille's for orders if I can avoid them. They can be difficult to deploy, they're more vulnerable, and often if you've taken a Camille it's because you've already taken as many Fugazi as you can, and it's a bit of a sign that you are maybe having too many models that are passive and not going to be active, except, except in this particular case, if we look at how that second combat group can function, if we have, say, three spare orders in that combat group, We've thrown our smoke with the Yan Yan, we don't need to do anything else with it, and we don't want to start pushing Fiddler forward. She can throw her drop bears and reload using the Camille, which makes the Camille actually productive. Fiddler, I think, is probably also very important to the list because one of the things that this list is a little thin on is defense. It can, it's can, it got like one credible aero piece, which I would usually not be willing to risk for aro, which means it kind of has to null deploy, hide behind things like Ida Swanson and the digger. The digger being linked makes it a good defensive piece, but you never want to have to defend purely at your deployment zone with a template model. And in a pinch, Fiddler's jackbots can be a very good first layer of defense that it's basically it if you lose the jackbots to an incoming attack but that's all you lose that's much much more tolerable than losing any of the other pieces in this list so overall as far as Drew's lists go, I think this one is its very interesting, it's very well considered. I personally would love to see 
if this player would play things any differently with access to Zelen Kriegers, which I'm not even sure were available to them at the basically in January when they would have been writing this list. Possibly, I, I can't remember. Regardless, what I think this list is a great showcase of is guys, you can play Druze now. Like, you can play Druze in events. And I, I would be afraid of running into this kind of thing. If I, like almost any of the lists that I play, if I run into this and I don't win the lieutenant roll and like snap pick going first, the knowledge that I may just have to weather like nine grenade shots, 10 grenade shots on my first turn and just freaking suck that up, that's like, that's horrifying. Even if that's not how this list is played, and often the time, I suspect often it wouldn't necessarily be, that's like, I've played against that in the old days against Starco when Emily Handelman was actually good because she benefited from full link bonuses. And that, that shit is crushing. Like, it's just demoralizing. And as much as playing against it is like just an exercise in, you know, do your breathing exercises and just push through the pain. Uh, the fact that this has made it into like 13th place out of 90 players is very cool. And it is very cool to see Drews actually taking a spot in like just genuinely, this is a faction. You won't play it a lot. You probably won't play against it a lot. That's its own advantage. But this is a faction that is genuinely playable. We saw it go to the top tables at CanCon in Australia and seeing it reach 13th place in 90, a 90 player event on the Infinity Global League is also really, really cool. So congratulations, Stripless, for making it to 13th. This and your other lists were all super cool. Next up in fifth place, we have Aelicine? Aelicine? Not sure. They are playing Vanilla 012, and they're just, their entire, like, across all four of their lists, there was some some absolute shenanigans going on, uh, but this one I particularly liked. Now, not to be outdone, right? This list, this list was paired with, I think, four hidden deployment troopers. Uh, but in this case, what we have are four combat drop troopers in an O12 shell that services that very, very well. So the list starts with an alpha lieutenant. This is just, frankly, for cost, probably the best lieutenant in the game in terms of command and control. It combines uh, plus command token strategos level one with counter intelligence on a model, if you can defend its silhouette for base, it can defend itself otherwise. For 24 points, this is just an excellent pace. We then, in the combat group, in the combat group one, the jump troop category, we have a crusher, which is a pseudo heavy infantry. These are all medium infantry, I believe. The crusher is a mimetism, no wooden cap, shock immune piece with a boarding shotgun and a panzerfaust. We then have two deltas, which are more generic drop troops, one of which has a boarding shotgun, one of which has a spitfire. And then Cuervo Goldstein, who comes back around to the elite side of things, once again, being a no wound incapacitation shock immune trooper, just with just absolute out the, out the wazoo, martial arts level four, CC 23, monofilament and DACCW and D charges. So never short of a weapon. Grover Goldstein, Goldstein is one of those CC murderers and he will arrive combat jumping on usually 16s because of the Evo Hacker in group two. We then have a Fuzzbot and a Flash Pulse remote, two Varangian guards with trench hammers and submachine guns and a Raven Eye officer with submachine gun, mine layer and EM mines. And then in combat group two, just when you thought we're like, that's surely, that's that's all of the meme potential in this list, right? It's the four drop Troops. No, 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 no. In combat group two, we have Casanova with infiltration plus three, Andromeda with infiltration plus three, another flashbot, another an Evo Evo hacker fuzzbot, and a war correspondent. So in short, this list woke up and chose violence. Holy hell! Uh, just like just to start with, this is really cool, right? Like this is something that we don't see particularly often. Usually, if I go to an event, even if I go to like a particularly large event, you will generally see like Australians. I, I usually obviously play mostly in Australia. Australians are experimenters. Australians will try and buck what they see as the trend. We have perennial tall poppy syndrome. We just cannot bring ourselves to play something that we think is hugely on meta. But even in that environment, there is almost always like a baseline of consistency that we try to flex out in our own way. I would probably never see something like this in an in-person event, because frankly, I think I'm, we're all just too chicken shit to play something like this. So mad plop, mad props to Alessine. Ale, I'm going to mispronounce that. I'm really sorry. Mad props to them for playing this. This is super cool. Now, setting aside the fact that this is like like a total meme. It made it to fifth place, and there are some optimizations here that are very, very clever. 
And I think they start in particular with how the combat groups are laid out. And it's the combat group two that most appeals to me for that reason. So, all right, we've got, we've got this big combat group one, which has, it's got 10 troopers, but four of those will begin off the board, which means that it's going to have six regular orders plus the alpha. So we're going to have seven regular orders can go up to eight by spending a command token for 012 prestige. And if one or two of those troops lands on the first turn, there's a very good chance that they will be spending like quite a lot of those orders. One thing I'm not sure about is whether or not this player would choose to land all of these troopers on the first turn. I actually wouldn't be surprised if they chose not to at least some of the time. You absolutely could just do a strike from the skies brothers moment and have everyone land all at once and just try and attack everything. But there's no actual real need to do that. I think most of the time what you would do is you would try and land a drop troop until you landed one and these guys will be landing on 15s or 16s once the Evo hacker gets the controlled jump support wear up, which means that you will often fail one of those four jump, jump troops over the course of the game. You'll typically, in you know, on a, on a relatively normal statistical variance, you'll fail one of them and succeed with three. Because you've got four drop troopers and they've all got about a 20 to 25% chance to fail. So one of them is going to fail, four, three of them will probably succeed, which means that you can land, if you choose to, one of them every round and keep spending orders on that one until you've, you've finished spending all of your orders in the group, and then land another one the next round and another one the round after that. If you can otherwise, like if you can keep your combat groups intact, if you can keep those Flashbots and Raven Eyes and Varangians and Evo, like the, the um, fat robots, if you can keep them alive, and you have the command tokens for O12 Prestige, you'll have a relatively consistent first combat group worth of orders to make these attacks every turn for successive turns. And that's probably a more appealing way to play this list than to try to land everything and attack with everything. Because unless the troop that you land dies, and if like the Crusher goes in first, for example, or Quevo Goldstein goes in first, those pieces have got no win incapacitation, shock immunity, they're going to be able to at least push through some defenses and keep doing damage. There's no special reason to try and land everything. You just, you land the first thing that you need to land and you keep attacking with it. The other thing that I like particularly about the first combat group is that, and just generally this decision to take not just like one drop troop, but four drop troops, is that a lot of the time, the kind of the nominal objection to drop troops is that they're very pass, fast pa pass fail. And if one of them fails to land, it does, it feels bad. It feels like you've made this sort of significant investment and it, whether or not it pays off is binary. But by taking four drop troops and literally making it the purpose of the first combat group to land and attack with these things, you do a lot to smooth out the curve. Like just knowing that, yeah, one of them is probably gonna fail every round, every game. That's just a thing that's gonna happen. Means that you're much less likely to run into the situation where, like if you just run one drop troop, then what you'll have is over the course of an event, you'll be like, yeah, once every like you know every three games the drop troop is going to fail and that game is going to feel bad with this list you have about once every game one drop troop will fail but that gives you a consistent experience relatively consistent obviously it's still a matter of dice that gives you a relatively consistent experience which you can use to play through an event because you're much less likely to have one game which you get where you get really badly screwed by bad luck, which undoes things for you at the moment where you least wanted it to. So that I think is really cool. The second thing, which I had veered away from, but which I also want to talk about, is I think the second combat group is very cleverly put together. This decision to play Casanova and Andromeda is a continuation of that same kind of theme. Where neither of those two models infiltrates into the enemy half of the table on hugely high numbers, but if you have both of them attempting to make that role, you really have very good likelihood that at least one of them will succeed. And if you have at least one of them land, what that gives you is a model in your second combat group that can spend every single order available to it attacking very efficiently. This is a four order combat group. It can potentially go, so five order combat group, it can potentially go up to six with O12 prestige, but one of those orders is going to be sucked up by the fuzzbot laying 
support wear in for the drop troops, which means that you are dealing with at most four or order, five orders in that combat group, and your opponent may choose to take two of them away from you. If Andromeda or Casanova land their infiltration rolls, then those, like, actually, of course, it's got counterintelligence, so Beth, roll that back. You'll always have at least some orders to play with. You'll have, if you use O12 Prestige on this, but you use it to activate the Fuzzbot, you, but you're willing to convert the War Cause order regular, which almost certainly it is, you'll still have always at least four orders to spend on one of those pieces. Four orders is plenty to do some serious damage with either of those. And so what that means is that by having your second combat group comprised of these elements, you have an extremely efficient... Now, it's only going to be the first turn. The first, you're going to go in on the first turn with these pieces. It's not like you're going to have that multiple layers of redundancy like you would with the combat drop, drop troopers potentially arriving over multiple rounds. But it means that out the gate, your turn one attack with these models is fearsome because you don't just have that combat jump trooper arriving. You also have Casanova or Andromeda or both going to freaking town. Now, of the two, Andromeda is the scarier, but not by a huge margin. Casanova, although he only has only has a submachine gun, he's a Mimetism 6, Ballistic Skill 13 gunfighter, which can very, very adequately just shoot things to death if he's so inclined. And he has no wind capacitation, shock immunity and EM mines, like by God, he has EM mines as well. So you can launch an attack with Casanova on something like a Link team, like an Andromeda is Andromeda, right? Like we stopped taking her as much back when she got the big nerf to how likely she was to land the infiltration, which made her a little bit scary to use in that kind of a role because she was pass fail. But just, just as taking all of these drop troops has smoothed the curve on your drop troop landing luck, taking both Casanova and Andromeda does the same thing for your infiltrators. So this list is capable not just of rolling up its sleeves and delivering an absolute haymaker punch on the first turn, but continuing on that attack and continuing to leverage that play over multiple rounds if it wants to. Now, I suspect that this was probably played in something like Firefight, because there are perishingly few specialist operatives in this list. Uh, Casanova is one. And Andromeda is another, which means that in unmasking, you could potentially just have those pieces be the pieces that that press a button to reveal the uh, to reveal the objectives. But broadly speaking, this is a list that I would play in something like Firefight, which was played in two of the three final rounds. Now, is this list kind of really hoping to go first? Probably, but. The thing about those combat drop pieces is that until they land, they're invulnerable. They can't be attacked. The worst your opponent can do is kill your Evo hacker, so they are a bit less likely to land. And if your opponent goes to the effort of doing that, they're probably, to at least some extent, have to move pieces forward. And drop troops tend to increase in power as the game goes on, and as your opponent's, like... Uh, layered defenses begin to slowly unravel just from sheer attrition and movement. On top of that... If you're going second, you have the option of just choosing to deploy Andromeda and Casanova as defensive pieces, as roadblocks. Not necessarily ideal, but if you have good locations for them in the midfield, you just don't roll the Infiltration plus six if you don't have to. And going after them, like trying to dig out either of those pieces, they both have Mimetism, they both have no Wounding Cap, they both have Shock Immune, they're both fearsome martial artists who can do a little bit of gunfighting. Like going after them is not easy. So you have, to an extent, a layer of some defense off of the back, back of those pieces, although I suspect what this list wants to do is go first and just freaking kill you. So overall, look, just an intensely cool list. I was incredibly happy to see this. This list is something I would never have the balls to play, much less pair with a super heavy in on a hidden deployment piece. But yeah, just just very, very cool. And the fact that it got to fifth place is awesome. So congratulations. I will now once again mispronounce your name. Alicine? Congratulations, Alicine, on fifth place. Uh, awesome, not just list, but lists. This was super cool. Finally, in first place, we have Apestrong playing appropriately Morats. Apestrong's list, this stood out to me just to start with that very first model there, which was the Morat Vanguard Lieutenant, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But we have a Morat Vanguard Lieutenant, a Morat Vanguard Paramedic, a Datok Hacker, a Kaitok MSV-1 with Fairback. Kaitoks are the super heavy Morat infantry, heavy silhouette, armor 5, not no wounding capacitation, but armor 5, Fairback, 
another Kytok with a Chain Rifle plus two Burst and Flamin Spear, a Suryat MSV-1 and Heavy Rocket Launcher, a Rindak FTO Paramedic. Rindak are heavy infantries of the no-wound no incapacitation variety, so single wound, no wound in the cap, shock immune, I believe they have structure, specialist, a whole ton of just weird rules. A Kytok, another Rindak, a Q drone with Plasma Rifle, an E-Drone, an Icadron, and two Dadarazi. Now, What's particularly interesting to me here is the decision not to take Kornak Gazerod. Kornak is a piece that is nearly ubiquitous in Morats as a lieutenant. And although he is very expensive at 45 points, what he gives you is a Strategos troop with plus one order, which means that he will add by himself three regular orders to the pool, his own regular order, and then the two lieutenant orders from Strategos. The thing about Kornak is that Although he is outstanding, and indeed, Apestrong would use him in at least one of his four lists, and there was another player also in the top 16 that was running what I would call more conventional Morat lists, and I think the other player had Kornak in possibly every single list. Kornak still costs 45 points, which is more expensive than almost any of your HI. Yes, three orders in, like, basically taking a combat group to... 13, or sorry, 12 orders plus your any tactical awareness you may have is incredible, but 45 points is a hell of a premium. And the decision to take a Morat Vanguard Lieutenant instead has freed up 31 points to upgrade other pieces in the list into heavy elements. And that gives us this first combat group, which has, on quick count, something like 16 and a half wounds in it, if you count the Dartox Dogged as half of a wound. That's like that's more than some lists just have in total. That is so, so much weight, and a lot of these wounds are on high armor pieces or otherwise resilient pieces. Shooting Rindax, for example, on screen there now is, is no joke because those things have dodge plus three and dodge minus three, which means that they dodge on 16s, and if you try and shoot them while they're dodging, you need to, you're need to rolling at minus three, which makes trying to hit them just tremendously annoying, and they're immune to critical and have the usual shock immunity, no wound in package. At armor three with effectively two wounds, Rindak are the lightest heavy infantry in this list, and it only gets heavier when we get to the Suryat and Kaitok troopers. On top of that, the presence of two Rindak here. Now, my assumption, that this there's actually a few ways that you could configure this. My assumption is we're running a five-person core, so the two Morats, the Dartok, the Kaitok Fuerback, and then the Kaitok Chain Rifle. Then a three-person team, the Suryat MSV-1 HRL, a Rindak, and a Kaitok, and then an unlinked Rindak. But you can configure these in a huge variety of different ways because Morats can choose to take two different, they can take two Harris teams in addition to their core. But my suspicion is probably that we have a five-person link, a three-person link, and then an unlinked Rindak. But it really could go any way. Those those two Rindax, right, one of them in a Harris team, one of them free running, actually gives you in this list, and we have a paramedic as well in the link team, in the big link, remember, you have three paramedics, all of which have plus one burst, the Morat Vanguard, because it's got plus one burst in the link team, the linked Rindak will actually be firing a burst three medikit, and then the unlinked Rindak will be firing a burst two medikit. All of these models have high enough fizz that you can actually, those heavy infantry are not going to be hard to recover just with paramedic darts, which means your ability to reconstitute this force if you take casualties is really, really good. Stopping this force from potentially recovering those Kytox, that Suryat, means killing basically a ton of pieces that are not easy to kill. And all of this has been afforded by the fact that they're not taking a 45-point lieutenant, they're taking a 14-point lieutenant. On top of that, we have the ability to either give that Q-Drone, and it's a plasma rifle Q-Drone rather than a... HMG Q drone. The lack of an, e an engineer and the fact that it's a plasma rifle suggests to me this was actually used as a mobile gun. And this is something that, like, combined army players have always known exists. But every time, like, every time you ever ask anyone in who plays combined army, hey, do you, well, you want to use the plasma rifle Q drone? They're like, yeah, that's really cool. Then we don't put it in lists because it's just a little bit too hard to move away from, like, engineer, HMG, I have to spend the SWC on a plasma rifle, mm, I guess, maybe. But marksmanshipping that plasma, like plasma rifles are incredible and it's a 6-4 platform. Marksmanshipping that Q drone means that it is, if it takes a chain rifle, it's going to freaking go unconscious and you can't recover it. It's not the end of the world. But if it just gets into a position where it can use that plasma rifle, hitting on 14s with mimetism, 
and then you try and fight it in reactive turn and the thing again marksmanship burst rate like that is really scary if i was if i was running ariadna for example do you know what shreds bear pods it's not viral well, i mean it is viral rounds but it's also plasma rounds plasma rounds completely circumvent total immunity like this thing is mobile and scary, and if it makes a run on you and does a bunch of damage and then dies, guess what the rest of the combat group consists of? So many heavy infantry. Like, so many. This list is so, so durable. And there's there's nothing that this list can't fight, either. We have multiple linked MSV-1 dangerous weapons, right? The Fuerback, that, that cutter that we saw being played four times across four lists by a Varuna player, right? Like, you can deal with that with something like the Kaitok. The Suryat Multispectral Visor with a at least Harris bonuses equally, right? It's dangerous. And if if one of these pieces go down, you have all of this core redundancy, you can just form up a new full five-person composition bonus core if you're so inclined. So two, two guns in the long-range presence with multiple smoke grenade pieces, plus the plasma rifle, plus, plus so much durability and the ability to reconstitute that durability and the mobility of Rindax. They have climbing plus, their 6-2 movement, etc. Like, this list just goes incredibly, incredibly hard, and it's really cool. Now, for my money, I would probably consider trying to get it to 15 troopers. It would be nice, for example, to have just a couple of pretters as disposable elements, but there is there is a couple of good reasons why you might choose to play 14 troopers here. The first is there's really nothing that can be cut from that first combat group easily. Like that is 10 troopers, which are going to be split across a variety of links. You can't really take anything out, which means that it's really only the second combat group where you have flexibility. And if we look at the second combat group, the E-Drone has to be there to do certain things. It's going to be doing support wear, and it's going to be giving, potentially giving tin bot bonuses or firewall bonuses to the Lynx. You have the Suryat to cover some of that, but you could definitely choose to use the E-Drone to give yourself fire firewall bonuses. <clears throat> but I wouldn't want to drop down below two models with smoke grenades. That Arazi are super high quality smoke grenade pieces. And that means we'd be doing something like splitting that Ica drone up into a couple of Garkis, which we'd be playing a point down. Garkis are very serviceable, they're high utility. That is a choice that I might choose to make. But the other good reason to play 14 troopers in Morats, particularly if you have an E-drone in the list, is that it just raises the specter of the Rassiat in your opponent's mind. That second combat group is totally functional thanks to the combination of the Dadarazi's impetuous orders and Dadarazi just being very capable, and the fact that the E-drone is a 6-4 specialist that can buff itself if it needs to to give itself marksmanship and go and fight some things. That list can play totally fine on four regular orders plus one irregular plus one extra regular order from O12 Prestige if it needs to. And so by playing it as four troopers, you just raise the possibility that, like, hey, there could be a Rassiat in this list. I've taken an Edra, and that means, or, or they drop suit Tariot. You can't, you, unless you literally plug this into Infinity Army, or look at those HI and be like, there's just no way you've got the points. They just, you can't, right, you can't, right, you can't. I've never seen a list without Corna. Do you have the points for, do you have the points for a drop troop in there? Surely not, but like, Maybe I'd better worry about that. Having a 14 trooper Morat list just means that your opponent has to think about the fact that you could have something off the table. Because Morats, right, they have they have no other well, they have no way to disguise. If they do have a drop troop, they have no way to disguise it. There's no way to put camouflage markers in the midfield that could be anything. Morats play with their hand completely face up, with the exception of is that vacant 15th slot actually vacant, or does it have a drop troop in it? And that makes people slightly more likely to think about the fact that there could be a drop troop there, which means that just having that little bit of bluff capability, like I, players players who have made it to the top 16, the top eight, the top two in a round of 90, will probably be able to look at your list and make at least some assessment with some confidence as to whether or not you've actually got something in the back pocket. Even the cheapest drop suit Tariot we can see there is 22 points. You're not going to trivially hit that in with all of those chonkers. But someone who maybe is less experienced or just doesn't have the same read, or even who is just being careful, right? Maybe someone looks at that list and goes, I'm like 90% sure that you can't possibly afford a drop troop on top of all of that stuff, but I'm only like 90% sure. And if I'm wrong and a drop suit Tariot 
like lands on me, I'm going to be in a real bad time. So I will just spend a little more time thinking about that and get like a little bit worried and maybe adjust my deployment to be a little bit less forward facing to account for the fact that something could land in my backfield. And that is like, that is ample advantage for effectively doing nothing. This, this vacant 15th slot lives rent free in your opponent's head. And that is worth having, like that's worth condensing two Garkis down into an Ikadron Batroid. But all of that aside, obviously the real play here is just the sheer like disgusting resilience of that first combat group. All of those super durable, super bullet, super effective heavy infantry can fight at a variety of ranges. Like look at all those pistols, all of those linked pistols, plus one burst pistols of high quality as far as the eye can see. And then we have the Rindax and the Morat paramedic to bring everything back. So just super clean, super effective, super forward facing. This is this is a great like way to play Morats that does not start by putting Cornite Gazerot in a list and then figuring out what else is going to happen. So I was not just impressed, but afraid of this list. And I am not surprised that this player made it into the round of 16 and then won the event. I've included the round of 16. Now this is a round of, just for clarity, this is the um, pre-round of 16 list. I may have had it mislabeled before now. This is the list that Apestrong played in the first few rounds of the event, and we saw some adjustments to his list as he got into the round of 16. Uh, I would say probably moving slightly back towards what I would consider the mean in terms of what I expect from a Morat list, but I chose to feature this one because I thought it was the coolest and most interesting. Uh, generally, though, we saw plenty of repeats on this theme. As we said, one of the lists that he took did feature Kornak, but only one of the four that he played. So overall, extremely cool list and very well done. I'm strong to winning, uh, not just the event, but winning an event that had 90 players in it played over a lengthy period of time. Those are never easy. They are, even with the like relatively leisurely pace, those are long events. Seven rounds, even spread over multiple weeks is a long event to play. So very, very well done for coming first place out of 90 players with Morats. Super cool. So that wraps this video up. Thank you very much to the IGL for making these lists available. These were sent through to me by the tournament organizer, Headshime. It was very interesting to look through them. And I did say at the time I was keen to do some kind of content on just covering the list that stood out. And there were a lot of lists that stood out. Really only had time in one video to cover three of them. Big thanks to Headshime for providing those lists and for talking through them with me and for talking about the IGL generally. If you're interested in the IGL, you will find a link to their website in the video description below. Otherwise, as always, if you want to support the content I'm making, you can do so via the buy me a coffee link in the video description below or by becoming a channel member. Big thanks to those who have so far. I'm hoping to be back relatively soon with some battle reports and faction focused videos, which have been quite well received. Thank you very much to the channel supporters and I will see you next time.